These people are waiting for the appearance of a living legend. Ministers of government, ambassadors and their wives, princes of the church, by now they've probably lost count of the number of times they've waited here at Addis Ababa airport for the same extraordinary man. In a moment, he'll step from the door of this aircraft to a scene that's even more familiar to him. And here he comes, the legend in person. One of the world's best known figures and faces, and one that most of us know least about. Father figure of modern Africa and relic of a vanishing world, feudal despot and reforming monarch, one of the last claimants to the divine right of kings, the legendary descendant of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. His Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie I, conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, elect of God, king of kings, emperor of Ethiopia. Haile Selassie celebrated his 40th anniversary as emperor, and his own people of Ethiopia came to do him honor. But Haile Selassie in his time has been far more than just the ruler of a small African state. He's become one of the great survivors of our day and of yesterday, riding out in shrewd triumph all that the 20th century could throw at him. Today, Haile Selassie is courted by all the world. At his anniversary reception, the representatives of a hundred nations came to salute the authority of this tiny old man. He was probably the first African leader to be treated by white men as an equal, and the first to be sacrificed by them in the name of appeasement. He's learned to trust nobody, except perhaps his dog, and yet he's won the respect of the world, for there's no man alive today whose life has spanned so much. Now, in his old age, he's practically the incarnation of the history of our time. Time began for Haile Selassie in this remote corner of the Horn of Africa in 1892. In London, Queen Victoria had celebrated her golden jubilee. In Africa, the colonial powers were carving up the continent, but the world Haile Selassie was to grow up to had not been dreamed of. He was born in a thatched hut and christened Tafari Makonnen, and though he was of Ethiopia's royal blood, his childhood on these hillsides was as carefree as childhood should be. Ethiopia, to the world then, was not much more than an African fairy tale. In European romance, it was the land of King Solomon's mines, Prester John and the Queen of Sheba, the place called Abyssinia, where the tribe of the Habashan was supposed to live. Only a handful of foreigners had reached its interior and found among its mountains the source of the Blue Nile. The rest was as dark as anything in darkest Africa, hidden by giant mountains from the deadly curiosity of the world. But Europe's romance was Ethiopia's living history. There was a rich empire here when most of Europe was in darkness 2,000 years ago. Its ruins still stand at Axum, its first capital. And the title of its first rulers, King of Kings, is that of Haile Selassie today.
The Empire's history since then is a rich confusion of fact and legend. There are still 50,000 people like these in Ethiopia who call themselves Jews of the House of Israel and claim descent from the first Jews out of Arabia 3,000 years ago. They observe the Jewish Sabbath and mark their pottery with the Star of David. Like Haile Selassie's imperial crest, the star crowns the Lion of Judah, the central Ethiopian symbol, begotten from Sheba, who bore a son to King Solomon and called him Menelik, the first Ethiopian emperor. But the central tradition of Ethiopia is Christianity. Long before most of Europe was converted, the empire was a pillar of Christendom, whose emperor earned another title that Haile Selassie carries today, the elect of God. The echoes of 16 centuries of Christianity sound with undiminished faith through Ethiopia's churches now. church in Ethiopia was a sort of barbaric Byzantium, and a crusading church as well, bestowing the light of Christ upon the heathen tribes. But like other crusaders, it was beset by the growing power of Islam. From over the Red Sea, the Arabs swept into Africa with their own revelation. Soon, Ethiopia was a Christian stronghold surrounded by the Muslim world. Hidden in the mountains from the Muslim invasion, the emperors and priests of Ethiopia kept the Christian faith alive. Here in the 12th century, the emperor Lalibela carved out of the rock the churches of what he hoped would be a new Jerusalem. It was the empire's capital for a hundred years and came to be known as Lalibela after its creator. 800 years later, Haile Selassie was to come here to pray for deliverance from Italy's invasion of his country. At the worst moment of his life, it was his way of declaring his ultimate faith in the God who was so essential to his empire's tradition, a tradition that the monks of Lalibela still voice in a haunting mixture of orthodox plain chant and African rhythm. In the long struggle with Islam, church and state became inseparable, and the Christian powers of Europe sent emissaries to the emperors to help them against the Muslims. One of them may have been Prester John, some Western Father Jean, perhaps, exiled and forgotten here for a lifetime. But in spite of Western help, many of the empire's provinces were overrun. The emperors themselves became nomads, wandering the highlands from camp to camp until here at Gondar in the 17th century, they came to rest again in renewed splendor. These castles of Gondar are unique in Africa. Probably some Portuguese helped to build them, possibly Indian craftsmen were brought in. But they're a sign of Ethiopia's special distinction in Africa as a place where the non-African world made some early mark on the continent. Gonda was only a brief revival of a declining empire. 
In another hundred years, the court was on the march again, still carrying the Christian banner, but challenged at every step by powerful feudal barons, as the kings of medieval England used to be. Only the church held Ethiopia together, and gradually authority shifted again towards the church strongholds in the central mountains. Here, the empire that Haile Selassie would inherit began to take shape under King Sahli Selassie, his great-grandfather. King Sahli was one of the most powerful barons, and it was to him that the new commercial empires of 19th century Europe came with their gifts and guns. And his kingdom was the foundation on which the Ethiopian empire was rebuilt. Its revival was heralded by a Christian crusade, led by a man who was half monk, half warrior, and who defeated all other contenders for the throne, the Emperor Theodore. But in 1862, Theodore fell foul of Queen Victoria. By a misunderstanding, she failed to answer one of his letters, and in a huff, Theodore imprisoned a British consul and some European missionaries in his mountain fortress at Magdala. When five years of diplomacy failed to secure their release, the British at last sent a military expedition to recover them. It was a ponderous exercise, but effective. With elephants, gun carriages and Indian sepoys under the command of General Napier, they clambered steadily into the mountains that had been Ethiopia's best defense for so long. The Ethiopians were no match for them. They had few rifles and no artillery to save their old empire from the new world. As Napier's army approached their last stronghold, Theodore shot himself. The new concept of empire had triumphed over the old. Yet in Theodore's medieval crusade, there was a glimpse of a new Ethiopia. And 20 years later, under the Emperor Menelik, grandson of Sahli Selassie and half-uncle to Haile Selassie, that glimpse became something like reality. Europe's scramble for Africa was then in full swing, and as the Western empires planted their flags all over the continent, only Menelik's Ethiopia seemed able to stand against them. At Addis Ababa in Sahli Selassie's old kingdom, Menelik created a new capital for his empire. It was Ethiopia's first permanent capital since the heyday of Gonda, 200 years before. Menelik's palace is still used 80 years later by Haile Selassie, and to him it's a permanent reminder of the day when Ethiopia showed that it could, after all, resist the power of Europe, when Menelik's army in these mountains defeated an Italian invasion at the Battle of Adowa. The year was 1896, and the traditional Ethiopian painting tells the story of a modern awakening. It was the first time a European army had been defeated by Africans since Hannibal beat the Romans 2,000 years ago. Menelik's celebrations were huge and noisy. For days on end, the drink ran like water and the tables were red with the blood of raw meat. In the rejoicing, the Ethiopians hardly noticed that they had still to pay a price for their independence. From now on, they would be enmeshed in the quarrels of the European powers. While the new ambassadors and their lady wives looked with astonishment at Menelik's medieval feasts, they were secretly seeking for allies here in the power struggle that was raging in Europe. Into this strange twilight world between yesterday and today, Haile Selassie was born. Now, after 80 years, he looks back on a lifetime that has spanned the gap between the 2,000 years of African tradition he inherited and our own jet-propelled international revolution that threatens to overwhelm him. One of his earliest memories is of the way our world first encroached on his, with the arrival in Ethiopia of the first British diplomatic mission to the court of his half-uncle Menelik. He was five years old. The year was 1897, just a year after the great victory of Adowa, 
and the British mission on its way to Addis Ababa stayed with the young Haile Selassie's father in the town of Harar. Harar then was a newly conquered province of Menelik's empire, taken from Muslim hands. Haile Selassie's father, Ras Makonnen, was Menelik's governor for Harar and a favorite to succeed to the throne. In Muslim hands, Harar had been a secret city, closed to non-Muslims for centuries. Forty years earlier, the British explorer Richard Burton had only been able to get here disguised as an Arab. He didn't think much of what he saw. The streets were stony and narrow, the faces were stern and secretive. He thought they justified the local proverb, hard as the heart of Harar. <laughs> Harar's not a great deal better now, but for what change there is, Haile Selassie's father can take some credit. He allowed French priests to open this little mission school in the town, and sent his son, Tafari Makonnen, to learn from them. Seventy years later, French is still the only foreign language Haile Selassie speaks with any fluency. Today, the school is little changed, but in coming here as a boy, Haile Selassie recalls that he had an advantage given to very few others in the empire at that time, and he's been obsessed with the value of education ever since. His father is remembered by Haile Selassie as an unusually enlightened man. He built Harar's first hospital. He opened the first Ethiopian state school. And because he knew he might one day become emperor himself, and that Tafari would succeed him, he tried to prepare his son as best he could for the changes that he knew were bound to come from the traditional ways of the old world to the revolutionary demands of the new. So throughout his boyhood, the young Tafari lived happily in his father's house with a future that seemed secure. But suddenly, his father died and Tafari passed at once from security into a world of medieval intrigue. He was only 13. Menelik was dying, paralyzed by a stroke. He had no son of his own, and with Ras Makonnen's death, the last chance of a clear succession had gone. His court was racked with the jealous plots of rivals for his throne. There was Taitu, his aging queen. Zauditu, his daughter, equally determined to get the throne herself. Ras Michael, a powerful provincial warlord, scheming to put his dissolute son and Menelik's nephew, Liege Yasu, on the throne. Against such plotters, the young Tafari had no chance. He was exiled as governor of another conquered province. Meanwhile, Menelik's palace seethed with treachery and murder, like the household of some African King Lear. For five years, the conspiracies tore the court apart, until in 1911, the doddering Menelik at last revealed his choice. Ras Michael's son, Liege Yasu, was the heir to his throne. The queen and his daughter were thrust aside, and Tafari Makonnen joined Ethiopia's other barons in swearing an oath of loyalty to his rival. As a reward, he was sent to his father's old job as governor of Harar. In Harar, Tafari was safely out of the way, a week's journey from the capital. He was just 19, but he was experienced far beyond his years. Already he knew not only how to run a province, but how to play a waiting game, and he knew there was still a crown to play for. He needed all his caution, because when Menelik died at last, and Li Jiasu was crowned, the new emperor was already half mad with syphilis, turning from youthful dissipation to exotic vice and murder. He tried to murder Tafari on this lake near Harar, where Tafari often went boating with friends. This time, Li Jiasu bribed a servant to hold the boat so that it sank in the middle of the lake. A friend was drowned. Tafari survived by swimming ashore. The foreign embassies dabbled in these plots as well. The new diplomats who'd surrounded Menelik now imposed on these medieval intrigues the shape of approaching war in Europe. Germany and Turkey stood with Li Jiasu. Britain, France and Italy swung to Tafari's side. 
It was 1914, and as the guns opened up on Europe's western front, 4,000 miles away, the contest in Ethiopia took an older shape. Christianity once again prepared for a clash with Islam. A Muslim empire in Africa was the bait dangled before Liji Yasu by Germany and Turkey. And in his craze for power, the new ruler of a Christian empire became a Muslim in all but name. For the Christians, it was the last straw. Vice, murder and rape they were accustomed to, but apostasy struck at the heart of their tradition. Liji Yasu was formally excommunicated from the Ethiopian church. And with British encouragement, Tafari was proclaimed regent with the title of Ras, or Prince. He was 24 years old. Zauditu, Menelik's daughter, was crowned empress at the same time. But the struggle was unfinished. Li Jiasu was still free, and on this great plain north of Addis Ababa, his father, Ras Michael, gathered an army to restore him to the throne. It was another medieval scene. The horsemen were dressed in the monkey skins of war with Ras Michael at their head. On the other side, Rastafari's men gathered for battle in the same way. In Europe, the bloodiest of modern wars was being fought with tanks, machine guns and poison gas. But here, the centuries rolled back as if to King Henry at Agincourt or Richard losing his crown at Bosworth Field. Like Menelik's victory at Adawa, this battle of Rastafari for his crown has become one of the great subjects of Ethiopia's popular art. The battle lasted a full day, surging one way and then another. But in the end, the man who rode back to Addis Ababa in triumph was Rastafari. It was a victory that he still recalls as the turning point of his life. But almost immediately, he was embroiled in the outcome of the other war in Europe. At the Versailles Peace Conference in their victory, the Allies again redrew the map of Africa. But once more, Ethiopia escaped. Playing off the great powers against each other, Rastafari kept his independence. Joining the new League of Nations, he put his faith in the latest post-war watchword, collective security. In such great company, one little country would surely be safe, for none would let another gobble it up. Instead, he hoped that all might compete in helping him to modernize his country and make it worthy of its place in the League. To extend his foreign contacts, he toured the European capitals. In London, the Times described his arrival as an historical event. In Stockholm, he met King Gustav, and the Swedes promised him doctors. In Brussels, he found financiers ready to invest in his country. The French were already in Ethiopia. They had completed a railway from the coast to Addis Ababa in 1918. It was Ethiopia's first physical link with the modern world, and it helped to establish Addis as a permanent center of Ethiopian government, as no capital had ever been before. But Tafari still needed all the foreign help he could get. Most of Ethiopia was still sunk in the Middle Ages, and Addis Ababa was still only a ramshackle place of tin roofs and open drains. He had to fight poverty and tradition, but he was still only regent, and his hands were still tied by his old enemies at court, who were once more plotting against him. It wasn't until 1930 that Rastafari won supreme power at last, and ascended the throne when the Empress Zauditu died. Crowned emperor at last at the age of 38, Tafari took the royal name of Haile Selassie, meaning the mighty trinity. His coronation was attended by men of rank and circumstance from all over the world. The Duke of Gloucester went from Britain. France sent a field marshal. Italy, the heir to the throne.
governors of Africa's colonial territories came to salute the independent African king. His own people poured into Addis Ababa in thousands to pay homage to the new emperor. At this moment, Ethiopia seemed about to be the first country in black Africa to step hopefully into the modern world. Instead, the modern world marched almost at once into Ethiopia far more brutally than before. Benito Mussolini, the Italian dictator, proclaimed he would create a new Roman Empire, and he aimed at the one place left for imperial conquest in Africa, Haile Selassie's Ethiopia. Mussolini's excuse was Ethiopia's backwardness, that same medievalism that Haile Selassie himself hoped to end. He told his soldiers they had a civilizing mission, but his ambitions dragged Haile Selassie straight into the 20th century's new barbarism. Hitler threatened the peace of Europe. As the Nazi troops marched, Western statesmen quailed at the thought of a new war. No wars are horrible. And as dangerous as they are hot. In the mouth of Ramsay MacDonald, Britain's Prime Minister, the age of appeasement was born. Its first sacrifice in the cause of peace in our time was to be the Emperor Haile Selassie. In Ethiopia, the Emperor could do no more than play for time against the Italian threat, winning the loyalty of the tribes and princes by a traditional mixture of prestige and bribery and hoping that his old friends, Britain and France, would still come to his rescue. But Haile Selassie and his men were whistling in the dark. The Italian troops were already embarking, and Britain and France would do no more than proclaim an embargo on arms sales to both sides. For Italy, with her own arms, the embargo was a green light. For Ethiopia, it was a death sentence. But for Haile Selassie, the final betrayal came at the League of Nations. Pierre Laval, the French foreign minister, and Sir Samuel Hoare for Britain, proposed to hand part of Ethiopia to Mussolini. Appeasement had triumphed. Collective security was a myth. In the war that followed, Haile Selassie had no chance. Forty years earlier, Haile Selassie's father had helped Menelik to beat the Italians at Adwa. Now Mussolini's troops had their revenge. Within a month, Ethiopia's first capital at Axum had fallen, and over 2,000 years of independence were nearly at an end. Abandoned by his international friends, Haile Selassie found even his own men unwilling to fight on. He had only a handful of trained troops, the rest were untrained tribal warriors, hopelessly outgunned. Before the Italian assault, the Emperor's army disintegrated. And at Easter 1936, Haile Selassie left his men to make a pilgrimage to the rock churches of Lalibela and to pray for his country. His prayers were unanswered. A month later, it was all over. In eight months of steady advance, the Italians had lost only a few hundred men. Haile Selassie had lost an empire. On the 2nd of May, his family took the train from Addis Ababa to Djibouti. On the 5th of May, Haile Selassie followed them. He left behind the agony of defeat to confront his betrayers at the League of Nations. Ladies and gentlemen, the second speaker on the list is His Majesty Nicholas Haile Selassie. He did so with a dignity that has become a legend. Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le...
the jeers of fascists in the gallery did not stop him. I am here to claim justice, he said. What reply shall I take back to my people? There was no answer, and there could be none. The League was dead. So, said the Emperor, it is us today, it will be you tomorrow. Haile Selassie went into exile in Britain. He was 44, and it seemed then as if his life's work had ended before it had begun. He vanished in the gathering storm of war that his downfall had started. Hitler had already re-entered the Rhineland. Austria was soon occupied. Munich was to follow, then Czechoslovakia, and finally, the German army marched into Poland, and at last, the world woke up. Britain and France declared war on Hitler's Germany. The age of appeasement was over. But as Europe went to war, appeasement's first victim seemed more than ever forgotten. Only when the war widened still further was Haile Selassie remembered again. When Mussolini joined Hitler in 1940, the Emperor automatically became Britain's ally, and his futile exile came to an end. Within weeks, Haile Selassie was back in Africa, waiting for the British to mount an invasion of his own country. The campaign was one of the swiftest and most successful of the war. In less than a year, the Italians were defeated, and Haile Selassie was on his way back home. He flew into Ethiopia from the Sudan, and while other troops fought their way to Addis Ababa from the coast, he returned by road through the mountains. Just above Addis Ababa, he stopped for a first look at his capital, five years to the day since he had left it. What one imperial power had put asunder, another had restored. The legend of Solomon and Sheba was rekindled. The Lion of Judah had returned. Ethiopia rejoiced, and so did Haile Selassie. For him, it was one of the greatest moments of his life, a chance to start again. Thirty years later, in the grounds of his palace in Addis Ababa, where he takes his daily walk among the lions that symbolizes imperial power, he reflects now that at that moment of return, he was already 50 and had accomplished little. The Italians had left very few colonial improvements for him to build on. They'd only been there for five years, and they'd left things pretty much as before. There was no central administration. There certainly weren't any bright young graduates. There were no army officers, and there wasn't even a common language. Fundamentally, Haile Selassie was back with the same ramshackle empire he had won before and whose primitive traditions he hadn't had a chance to scratch. When Haile Selassie returned, his empire had 20 million people a hundred different tribes and 50 different languages, and was twice the size of France. It was a proud empire, but its two or three thousand years of tradition underwrote poverty, disease, and ignorance. An empire where more than half the people were pagan or Muslim, yet were ruled by a Christian monarch, whose church was still the only source of unity. A secluded empire, where life had remained unchanged for centuries. An empire, in fact, as backward and conservative as anywhere in the world.
There was no easy escape from the isolation and poverty of Haile Selassie's empire. There was no mineral wealth, no really modern economy of any kind. There weren't even any communications. The Italians had built a few roads, but the war had destroyed them again. And one of the first decisions the emperor had to make was whether he should rebuild the roads through these mountains. He decided he wouldn't, for the time being anyway. Instead, he put his faith in the air. With American help, he created a network of tiny airstrips that broke down the isolation of the interior for the first time. When the 1950s opened, Ethiopian airlines were in business. It was Haile Selassie's first major accomplishment in modernizing his country. There was everything else still to be achieved. Yet at this moment, by a stroke of luck, Ethiopia's past for the first time came to the aid of the present and made Haile Selassie and his capital the focus of Africa's new hopes. As almost the only independent African ruler after the war, Haile Selassie provided a symbol of self-respect for black men just emerging from white rule. The wind of change had come to Africa. Recognizing the emperor's unique position, the United Nations chose Addis Ababa as its African headquarters, and he embarked on a new political career. The age in which we live, your Imperial Majesty, is an age of paradox. In his brand new Africa Hall, Haile Selassie presided at innumerable meetings of his new revolutionary colleagues. He became the great African father figure, the great African peacemaker, in the Congo, in Biafra, in Morocco and Algeria. It was a strange apotheosis for the King of Kings. He didn't always succeed, but his voice commanded respect, because he alone in Africa had been both victim and victor in the struggle against colonial rule. He alone had been the first martyr of the old League of Nations and was now a founder and guide of the new United Nations. Seeing his influence in the new Africa, the world beat a path to his door. The Organization of African Unity followed the United Nations and set up shop in Addis Ababa. Diplomats and businessmen flocked in. Within a decade, the face of Addis Ababa was transformed. The signs of international affluence towered over the old open drains. With the bankers and diplomats came foreign money and foreign aid. There were new ports, new roads, new dams to be opened. America trained the emperor's army. Russia built his schools. Israel provided technicians. India supplied teachers. Britain brought doctors. France offered culture. Germany sent trade missions. Haile Selassie's old empire had become the new African showcase, and everyone wanted an exhibit there. Today, Haile Selassie is besieged by foreign delegations hoping to catch his ear. He balances these contemporary forces to strengthen his own independence as shrewdly as he juggled half a century ago with the rival tribes and princes in his old fight for power. One day, it may be a Japanese delegation. The next day, a mission from Maoist China. It doesn't matter what political persuasion they are, they all see Haile Selassie as an essential link to the rest of Africa. At home or abroad, half his life seems consumed with ceremonial state visits, some of them purely political, some of them simply a tribute to his personal stature. Even with Italy, he's made friends again. On a state visit to Rome, 30 years after Mussolini's troops had been driven from his country. At home, he seems all-powerful, 
adding to the natural mystery of a divine monarchy, the artificial cult of personality. His name is everywhere. His presence seems all-pervading. His word seems law. His ministers are overshadowed by him, and his government is run by him. His palace is surrounded by all the machinery of a modern administration, but even his prime minister brings the important decisions back to him. In his old age, it looks as if Haile Selassie has routed all his enemies at last, to emerge supreme, as if the all-wise and benevolent Lion of Judah has prevailed. Yet the one thing Haile Selassie has not prevailed over is his own country. Outside Addis Ababa, the traditional Ethiopian ways have hardly changed at all. The emperor's writ runs only as far as his governors can ride. Sometimes that may not be far enough. Less than a third of Haile Selassie's people live within a day's ride of any sort of road. It's over 60 years since Haile Selassie in his youth started his career as governor for the Emperor Menelik in this very province. And the system's no different for the man who represents him now. Every time the governor rides out into the farther reaches of his province, he gets a royal welcome. Like Haile Selassie in the old days, the governor still needs guards to protect him, servants to tend him, even interpreters to translate for him, because hardly anybody in the remoter provinces speaks the language of the emperor's government. It's government in the medieval style and modern Addis Ababa seems very far away. Even the bigger villages eye for an island village. where all the men of a community are summoned by the Emperor's Commissioner to uncover a criminal. It's the village elders who make the investigation. If they can't agree on a culprit, every man present will suffer his share of a collective punishment. If the finger points to one man, he can expect short shrift. In every village marketplace, the public gallows still waits for the murderer or the rebel. But what's law for the poor in Haile Selassie's empire is less often law for the rich. The Ethiopian parliament is the emperor's own creation, a little nudge of his people towards constitutional government but it's twice refused to pass the emperor's own land reform law because its members won't give away their own privileges. As the years go by, the emperor's step gets slower. He may live in some splendor himself, but he knows the Ethiopian peasant is still as poor as any in Africa yet he's paralyzed by the traditions he's inherited from 2,000 years ago. Landlords and princes dominate his parliament and hold the countryside in fee. The peasants own nothing, and at harvest time, the landlords and their bailiffs come to demand their share of the crop. The landlords may not be as powerful as they used to be, but like the barons of feudal England, they're still strong enough sometimes to hold even the monarch at bay, still strong enough to hold the people in complete subservience. Biggest of all the landlords is the Ethiopian church. History has made it inseparable from the empire, 
and now, as powerful as the great monastic orders of medieval Europe, it dominates the life of the Christian highlands. The church is the cross that is also the nation's salvation, both a reactionary burden and a civilizing influence. Its priests may be ignorant, but they're usually the only people for miles around who can read or write. Its schools are pathetic, but until Haile Selassie's reign, few other schools existed. 90% of his people remain totally illiterate. Nearly half the population of Ethiopia now is under the age of 15. And for Haile Selassie, their education has always been an obsession. He's taken personal charge of the Ministry of Education, sought teachers and money for more schools from half the countries in the world, and turned one of his palaces into a university. He's directly responsible for whatever schooling these youngsters get. But like everywhere else, the more they have, the more they want. School strikes and revolutionary slogans take command and Haile Selassie's efforts are dismissed by the young as mere failure and repression. The educated middle-aged are rebellious too. They owe their privileges to the emperor as much as to anyone, but they whisper their discontent in the posh bars of Addis every night and can't wait for the old man to go. But the old man's still there, as shrewd and ruthless as ever. He still knows how to balance one force against another, playing off traditional resentments against novel discontents. Some of the latest challenges to Haile Selassie's rule combine the old and the new Ethiopian divisions and discontents. Down near the coast in Eritrea, where the Italians had their empire for half a century, there's a popular liberation front now, fighting for independence from Haile Selassie and joining the old battle of Islam against Christianity with a new revolutionary movement against an ancient monarchy. The emperor can send his army to deal with that. But it hasn't always been easy for him to deal with his army. His soldiers now are a far cry from the barefoot rabble that Mussolini's men destroyed nearly 40 years ago and farther still from the medieval cavalry that won him as crown 20 years before that. But only 10 years ago, some of his soldiers tried to throw him out and very nearly succeeded. It could happen again, the classic 20th century military coup d'etat against an aging ruler. Haile Selassie is a lonely man now. His wife, two sons, a daughter are all dead, and though others remain to keep him company now and then, the essential solitude of his life on the tightrope of power must grow more oppressive every year. On one side, there's still the old Ethiopian world of feudal power and tradition. On the other, there's the new challenge of his own reforms, the educated youngsters and the modern army officers who want the world and would like it now. They're the upper and nether millstones which have ground many a good man exceeding small, especially in this century. To have survived them for the better part of 55 years in power is something unequaled by any ruler in the world today. No wonder the Lion of Judah has become one of the living legends of our time.